Stanford University. Welcome. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here and speak to you guys about what we're doing with uh, the Kleiner Perkins Eye Fund and a bunch of the companies we've funded. I know you guys are all enthusiastic app developers as, uh, as, as students in the iPhone or iOS class. Uh, my name is Chihua Chen. I'm a partner at Kleiner Perkins. I focus on consumer web and mobile investments at KP. I've been there for three years, and prior to that, I was an entrepreneur, either an uh, early employee or a co-founder of four different startup companies. Um, we announced in March of 2008, when the iPhone SDK came out, that we were going to invest $100 million in the uh, iPhone application and services ecosystem. Uh, that was going so well that six months ago, we announced that we expanded it to $200 million. And at the time that we did the initial announcement, of investing $100 million in iPhone applications, a lot of people had many questions as to why we would do that. And there really are five major trends that are driving this opportunity for both investors and entrepreneurs to start new companies and build interesting new applications on this platform that's emerging. The first is uh, the universal presence of 3G. So despite the fact that sometimes you don't get very good reception or data reception on your smartphone, 3G is becoming near ubiquitous in developed countries, and you are getting broadband into your pocket. It's something that never existed before. Second, obviously, is the entry of a company that knew how to make great consumer products and great consumer experiences into the mobile ecosystem. The old mobile phone developers were primarily you know, uh, technically oriented hardware CE manufacturers that built uh, menu driven, difficult to navigate, hard to develop for applications. But Apple's entry created a system that actually allowed consumers to experience directly the full power of a mobile application. Um, the iPhone itself is an incredible piece of hardware. I'm sure many of you guys have it here, an iPod Touch for development. Um, and the App Store did something unique for entrepreneurs, which was enabled entrepreneurs to access the customer directly for the first time. Before the App Store, the way that you, a startup uh, entrepreneur, could reach customers would be to go and try to get a meeting with Verizon's business development group. And you'd probably wait weeks, maybe months to get that meeting. And then you'd go in and you'd show them your application. And they'd say, well, we kind of like your application. Maybe we don't like your application. There'd be a long process of negotiating whether or not your application met their requirements. And then you'd end up in their legal group. And maybe you'd spend a month or two trying to negotiate a contract with them, at the conclusion of which they took 50% of your revenue. And you just hoped one day that they might put you in the catalog where you actually could appear to customers. Mm -hmm. Apple changed that completely. You, one individual developer and go, you can get a developer license, you can build your software over the weekend, you can upload it, it gets approved within a week or two, boom, you're on the store, you're selling the, selling the application, and <laughs> Apple's sending you money. So obviously, it completely changed the entrepreneurial uh, opportunity for accessing the market. And finally, a desktop quality, uh, world-class software development kit to build applications which functioned in a way that's appropriate for the mobile environment. And uh, you know, the, the investment thesis here and the opportunity to build new startups is driven by uh, the sheer adoption of mobile devices, specifically the iPhone. I'll use as an example, as a matter of comparison, the iPod. So how many of you guys have iPods? All right. How many of you guys have more than one iPod? Yeah, I've got five. Um, this is how fast my daughter, who's, who's like 20 months old, has her own iPod. Uh, this, this is how fast the iPod grew. Uh, roughly 11 quarters after launch, they sold 2.5 million iPods. Remember, you guys all have them now. It's ubiquitous. If you compare over the same period of time, the red bar is the iPhone, and the yellow bar is the iPod. So the iPhone is growing at a roughly 10 no, roughly 20x faster rate than the iPod did. Okay, and you guys have heard about this little thing called the iPad as well. We have the iPod, which is now ubiquitous. We got the iPhone, which is growing 20 times faster. The green bar is what the iPad is doing on sales. These are real, the iPad actually, the Q3 number is a projection that we have internally, but the Q1 and Q2 numbers are, are accurate as uh, initial sales of the iPod iPad in the first two quarters as compared to the yellow bar, the iPod, and the red bar, the iPhone. 
So this ecosystem is exploding, and the addressable market in which you as an entrepreneur can build an application is getting much larger, much faster than ever before. How about the distribution opportunity? How many of you guys have bought an iTunes? Okay, this is a college campus, so you guys still steal your music? <laughs> uh, okay, many people, well, when I, when I was here in the 90s, we never bought anything. Uh, we never bought any music. We just copied it off Napster. But I never did it personally. I know a lot of people who did. Uh, but obviously, iTunes is now very popular. It's the largest uh, digital music, and I believe music vendor, on the planet. Well, this is what's happening in the App Store compared to iTunes. The red bar is the number of apps that have been downloaded, and the yellow bar is the number of songs that have been downloaded. So the opportunity to distribute your applications directly to a consumer on the device is exploding as well. So far, what have we done in the iFund? We've invested in 15 companies, and I'll go through them in just a little bit. Uh, those 15 companies have had well over 150 million downloads. They represent, uh, I don't have this metric up here, but they represent 100 million minutes per day of user engagement. That means iPhone and iPod Touch and iPad users around the world use iFund applications 100 million minutes per day. Uh, they'll do over 100 million in revenue in 2010. And uh, we invested $100 million initially in these companies. And we've had follow-on investors invest another $330 million behind that to finance these companies. Here's some of the companies. You guys might know them. Uh, Goji is a group text messaging platform. Uh, text and image messaging platform that's based down in Los Angeles, founded by the founders of Jamdat. NG Moco was founded by Neil Young of uh, Electronic Arts, and we just announced two days ago that um, DNA acquired the company for $400 million. Uh, Shopkick was incubated in our offices. It's a real world uh, loyalty program where you get points for physically walking into a store and you can convert those points into gift cards and products. Uh, Flipboard, some of you have probably seen on your iPad. It's, a, it's the world's first social magazine. Uh, Inmobi is the world's second largest mobile ad network behind the combined entities of Google and AdMob. Uh, Booyah is a real world gaming company. Zynga, you guys probably have played their games either on uh, iPhone or uh, on Facebook. And there's also three stealth ventures that we have not yet announced amongst this group. So since I'm talking to a group of people who are learning how to build their first iOS applications, I thought I would offer three big ideas for what you can pursue. And the reason I'm focusing on the big ideas is the reality, if you want to start a company, starting a dinky company is just as hard as starting a great company. So you may as well start a great company. And let me, let me expand on that a little bit. When you start a dinky company, you think to yourself, OK, well, I'm just going to do something really easy and really small, and maybe I'll be able to sell it. The challenge is that when you're starting a dinky company, it's harder to raise money for it. And it's harder to attract great people to help you go that, do that dinky thing because you turn to that other great engineer that you know and you say, hey, we're going to go build another fart app. Please join me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take over the world. That person might not be as inspired as you to build another fart app. But if you're trying to build something great, you can hire great people to join you on the journey to building a great company. And therefore, you will be able to accomplish much larger tasks in the process. So my encouragement to you as we get into these big ideas is build something big and interesting. So three ideas. One, an artificial assistant. Um, all web services these days are, or nearly all web services these days are connected via open APIs. So let's say, for example, that uh, Paul and I are scheduled to have dinner this evening in Palo Alto. He's up in the city. I'm sitting in my office. And we're scheduled to have dinner at 7 o'clock. And we've made a reservation through OpenTable. There's no reason, from a software perspective, that Paul's phone should not be able to be aware of the fact that at 645, he is still in San Francisco. There's a traffic jam on 101. It's highly unlikely that he's going to be able to get down to Palo Alto in time to meet me for dinner. His phone should send me a message and say, Paul's running late. Would you like to call him or text him? His estimated time of arrival is 7.30. He's getting in the car right now. He's walking down the stairway. He's going, to his, he's going to the parking garage. He's getting in the car. And I've automatically rescheduled your reservations through OpenTable at Tamarin, moved it from 7 to 7.30. Boom, hit yes, all done. 
I sit at my office for another 35 minutes. I get in the car, I go meet Paul at 7.30. You never have a lost appointment. You never have a lost reservation. You never, have, you never are subject to the vagaries of scheduling. Now, all of those services and that information base is available today. No one has yet pulled it together into a single application that can sit on your phone and is always with you and solves all of those problems through software. That's an interesting and big idea that I encourage you guys to think about. Secondly, touch your media. The iPad is this beautiful device that now, at least my behavior at home, I don't use a laptop when I sit on the couch anymore. When I watch TV, I've got my iPad in front of me. And as I watch things on the TV, my second screen experience is I look things up. Maybe I look for a particular celebrity's name. Maybe I look for a synopsis of the show that I'm watching. Maybe I look something up on Wikipedia. Well, the iPad also has uh, the ability to sense what media is playing. Uh, microphone. So does the iPad have a microphone? I know the iPhone does. The iPad has a microphone? OK. So the iPad can sync with the media that's on your television screen and know exactly what's playing and show you information that's consistent with what's actually occurring on the screen. There's a couple different use cases for this. Imagine you're watching a pro sports game, right? The iPad application that you're running, here's, and Kobe, slam dunk. Now I'm a big Lakers fan. Well, the iPad should be able to present to me 15 of Kobe's greatest slam dunks. Where is it going to get that information? Well, thankfully, there's an open API at YouTube, and YouTube has uh, a lot of this content available that users have already curated and turned into small clips. When a celebrity appears on screen, when a product appears on screen, all that information should be able to be synced up into a second screen experience that can be experienced simultaneously with what has previously been a lean back broadcast experience that you simply are a receiver of, you can't participate in. So touch your media. I think that's another big area of innovation. And finally, reinventing commerce. So the web, uh, when it came out, was pretty cool because instead of going to the store, you could just go to your computer and you could pull up what looked like a catalog in your web browser and you could buy something. But why is it the static experience that it is? There's no reason that that experience should be static in any way once you have an uh, a device that you can touch and you can interact with. For example, if I'm looking at um, the Pottery Barn catalog, Pottery Barn always has a room arrangement that they've designed, and that room arrangement has a bunch of different furniture in it. I should be able to sit in my couch, and I should be able to just navigate around that room, see everything that's in it, touch a particular product, get more information, transact, share with my friends, find out who else owns that product and the content associated with it. So using the accelerometer and using um, a, a bunch of the technology that are embedded in iOS that you guys are learning about, that can make commerce a much more integrated experience as well. So just three areas, you know, not necessarily specific product ideas, but three areas that I would suggest playing around with as you guys are thinking about developing your applications. At a macro level, I'd also encourage you to think about where this platform is headed. If you build for today without a roadmap to where it's going to go tomorrow, it will be obsolete really quickly. So what we tell a lot of our entrepreneurs is assume that within three to five years, we will live in a world where you can run 30 times as much application on that device in your pocket, and you'll have a terabyte of storage in your pocket. What would you do? What should your product roadmap look like with that as an eventuality? I know for those of you who are in the lecture that we did with Dan Rosenzweig at ETL, uh, Dan talked about betting on the inevitable. This is inevitable. So as you're thinking about developing software and productizing a roadmap, that roadmap should lead to a world in which this is true, and your applications should have a roadmap for taking advantage of that. Um, so let's spend a few minutes talking about uh, the criteria that we've seen success, uh, the, the aspects of the companies that we've invested in that have made them successes on the Apple App Store. Now, uh, again, 150 million downloads, 100 million in revenue, 100 million minutes per day of user engagement. What is it that makes these things successful? Well, first of all, they are inherently mobile use cases. What does that mean? That means that it's not something that you can necessarily do 
from a web browser sitting at your PC. Why is that important? Well, you know, we oftentimes see business plans that say, um, I want to be the Google of mobile. What does it mean to be the Google? Well, I'm going to do mobile search really well. I'm going to do it better than Google. Now, there's a possibility that a company might be Google for mobile, but in all likelihood, Google will be the Google for mobile if you're not reinventing the use case around mobile as well because they have uh, you know, about 15,000 engineers that are focused on solving this problem of search and trans transferring the knowledge and the technology they have into the mobile environment with ever so slight tweaks. If you're pursuing an inherently mobile use case, it could be something very different where it is uh, not search in terms of typing in a search term, but standing in a particular location and having information flow to you based upon the time of day and where you're physically standing. That's an inherently mobile use case that the incumbents won't necessarily be able to do. Similarly, I want to be the eBay of mobile. I want to be the Amazon of mobile. Uh, while these are grand ambitions, I would encourage you to think specifically about the inherently mobile use case that makes your product unique. Secondly, context over content. Uh, the traditional wireline web is very content driven. Uh, by and large, when you and I go to the home page of CNN.com, we see the same content. When you and I go to the home page of the New York Times, we see the same content. Uh, there are certain sites that are personalized. Facebook is personalized. Um, um, you know, my Yahoo is personalized. My Google is personalized. But the vast majority of the web is content centric. In the mobile world, you need to take the content and put it to the side and focus initially on the context. What does it mean to focus on context? It means location, time of day, people, social relationships, all of the things that can drive customization of the content so that the experience is different for me and you depending on where we are and what we're doing. So for example, uh, I walk around downtown Palo Alto and I pull up an application. That application should be able to tell me which of my friends have eaten in which restaurants and what they had to say about them and based upon the time of day, tell me the appropriate menu and pricing for the restaurants on that street. On the web, that would be a series of searches. That'd be a very, very complex, potentially, series of searches. It'd be a bunch of emails to my friends asking, which restaurants did you eat at? It'd be a search of Yelp, and then maybe diving into some of the individual websites of those, uh, of those restaurants to find out what the menus are for the day. In the mobile world, you can take advantage of all that context, because what do you have? You've got physical location. You have an address book on your phone, so it knows who all of your friends are, and can immediately find out that information. And due to the fact that it's aware of what time of day it is, it can bring in the feeds of the content around menu and information that's relevant at that time of the day. Um, Real-time immediate utility. Okay. This is a really critical one, because we've made this mistake several times in our investments and with some of the entrepreneurs we work with. When building for the App Store, you have to assume that the average consumer is not as smart as you. So don't use yourself as the average user. Because what you do when you consider yourself the average user is you imprint a level of sophistication on the application use case, which really doesn't exist for the average iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad user. Instead, what you want to do is build an application that reveals itself over time. But the moment it's downloaded, it provides instant utility. What's a perfect example of that? Shazam. One of our portfolio companies, we, we all love this service, so we decided to invest. The reason it's so incredible is you can use Shazam while you're driving in the car. You got a baby screaming in the background, which is often true for me. You pull out Shazam, and it's just a big button. And there's really nothing else you can do on that page. You push the button, and in 10 seconds, it tells you what song is on the radio. That is really simple real-time immediate utility. Now, Shazam also has a lot of other functionality. If you look carefully, you can buy a song, you can read the discography, you can see, the, uh, see other content on YouTube, you can buy concert tickets, 
You can link to blog posts for the band that you just tagged. You can save it for later. You can do all these things, but it's not a series of buttons that has 16 different options for you. So the user comes in and the first time he experiences the application or she, she opens the application, they're confused as to what to do. The utility is upfront, it's really simple, and it's immediate. That's perhaps the most important thing I can impress upon you guys with your application design is make it super stupid simple for the users. Um, that's somewhat related to the issue of simplicity. Having too many functions up front makes it very, very confusing for a user and makes it hard for them to decide what you stand for. In all consumer-facing applications, the ones that we've found that have been successful, it stands for something to the user. And as a result, the user will go back over and over and open that application for that purpose. Uh, number five, frequent usage. One of the challenges um, with, with any web and mobile, but specifically in this app world, is that all of the functionality of the internet is being disaggregated into little tiny pieces of content. And users are ending up with dozens, if not hundreds, of applications on their phone. And they're going through page and page and page of application. And it's easy to get lost. So in order to make sure you don't get lost, it's important that you design your application for frequent usage. Frequent usage can come through a combination of utility as well as features that notify the user and to draw them back in. For example, using push notifications, using text message notifications, uh, integrating with Facebook profiles, things like that. Um, the, the assumption, the easy assumption is to make is I built something really cool and I'm going to put it on the App Store. People are going to download it and they're going to start using it. Boom, we're done. The reality is there's 250,000 going on to 500,000 apps on the App Store and the average user has close to 100 apps on their device. So you have to find a way to actually build an engagement model that drives frequent usage because it's really easy to lose your customers and customer retention is difficult on, on the iPhone and, and iPod Touch. Inherently viral. Um, the reason that's important is because it's hard to acquire customers in an app store where there are hundreds of thousands of applications and Apple only features a certain number of applications every day. Many of our most successful applications have been driven by invitations or word of mouth. So it's important that you build an application that is social in nature and is more useful to the individual if he or she is able to tell their friends about it and get them using it too. Uh, massive scale, fortunately, the iPhone iPod Touch has taken care of the underlying market opportunity. But if you build a very, very narrow application that only a few people can use, then you have to make sure that you price it really, really high. Likely, even if that's the case, it's going to be a relatively small business. If you want to build a very large, scalable opportunity, it needs to be something that applies, that is useful to 50, 60, 70 percent of people who own these devices. Uh, natural business model, there are many that have emerged now uh, in the iOS and smartphone ecosystem. Uh, advertising, obviously, uh, was popular, as was pay for download. The most popular um, we've seen that has really taken off in our portfolio is virtual goods purchases. So virtual goods aren't only games. I think oftentimes people think of virtual goods as items within a game. But a virtual good can be any piece of digital content or any piece of functionality that you can sell in an application, which enables you to start free and eventually earning the user's trust and credibi earning credibility with the user to sell them additional functionality over time. Cross-platform, uh, I think, is an, is an interesting one that we, uh, you know, to be honest, we haven't yet seen many companies do this really, really well. But marrying the web and mobile extremely well is really critical for, for long-term success here because it enables you to interact with the user when they're in front of their, uh, their desktop or their laptop as well as when they're in their mobile. A good example would be Facebook. Facebook is very well integrated across the platforms. The mobile photos you take show up in other people's Facebook news feeds that they might be viewing through a standard web browser. Uh, but this is still a challenging area that I think requires continued innovation. And finally, you, know, you guys are in the midst of this right now. Apple, and, uh, Apple continues to release 
many um, features and enhancements to the platform, and you can really differentiate significantly by taking advantage of some of the newest features on the platform. So, um, you know, we're oftentimes asked, what are the components of a business plan? If you want to come in and, you know, speak with Kleiner Perkins or any other venture capital firm or, or, or investor of any type, what are the things that you need to pay attention to and fully flesh out? Um, I'll go through, through these in some level of detail, but we can certainly take questions afterwards. I think there's five components to a good business plan, and thinking through each of these in depth will help you to have a good conversation with an investor. But more importantly, it will help you to have a good conversation with you and your teammates about the kind of company that you want to build. Uh, the first is the market. What is the market? What problem are you solving in the market, and how large is it? So you want to always go after big markets because you can have um, incomplete or subpar execution in a huge market and still be successful. You want to be careful of very, little mar very small markets where you have to have perfect execution to be successful because otherwise your business isn't of sufficient scale. Uh, the unsolved need within a market is important to articulate carefully. For example, Shazam. What, what is the unsolved need that Shazam articulates? In one sentence, what's that song? Right? That's a, that's a very clear unsolved need because there's plenty of people who they hear a song and they say, what's that song? Now, the business model is, is a different uh, conversation and it ties to based upon solving that unsolved need, how do you make money doing it? But be really clear on what the unsolved need is in the market. And in terms of like for ex using Shazam as an example again, I'm sure that every day there are hundreds of millions, maybe a billion people who hear a song and either think to themselves or ask a friend, what's that song? That's the size of that market opportunity. Uh, secondly, the team. So pick your teammates very, very carefully. You will spend, if you're doing a startup, you will spend many more hours with them than you do your husband, your wife, your dog, your mom, your dad. You're going to be living with these people. The average startup lasts longer than the average marriage in America. So pick your teammates very, very carefully. What do you want to have in the team? Well, you want to have alignment of values. You want to make sure that you guys care about the same things. You guys are doing this for the same reasons. Uh, you want to have complementary skill sets. Uh, certainly in an engineering driven culture, you want to have people who are excellent technically, but also care a lot about the customer and understand the customer design problem and the value and the value being delivered. Um, and you also want to have fun. You want to make sure that there's a good cultural fit because you're going to be spending a lot of time with these folks. What do we look for in teams? We look for people who are extremely passionate and driven to solve a problem and bring some unique insight or capability to solving that problem. Product. So product is, uh, product can be defined in so many different ways, but the way I like to think about it is how does your product solve that problem in, in point number one, excellently. And it should be done in a way that is unique, it's elegant, and it's differentiated. Um, ideally, it's very defensible as well, but we'll talk a little bit about that in technology. Um, people pay too little attention to product in a lot of startups because, yeah, okay, I built this technology, I'll solve this problem, boom, there it is. Well, the way that you solve a problem is oftentimes more important than the fact that you've solved it because the way that you solve a problem is the customer experience in that solution. And you know, Apple, of course, is a, is, is a prime example of solving problems very ele elegantly in products. Uh, technology is absolutely still important. If you think about Zynga, Zynga is a technology company. Facebook, Facebook is an underlying technology company. They put interfaces on top of those technologies, but what they have is very high performance technologies that can solve problems at large scale. And I, you know, I, I know there's an ongoing debate right now is Silicon Valley you know, no longer innovating and focusing just on design over technology. Well, I'll tell you, having seen things like Friendster, <laughs> design gets you to a certain point. But if you don't have technology that scales, you fall off a cliff pretty quickly. So technology continues to matter. Uh, and finally, business model. Um, I think that the best companies, they reinvent both the product 
and the business model simultaneously. Somewhat interesting companies reinvent one of the two, but it's generally less defensible and is generally less of a scale opportunity if you've only reinvented one of the two because it's much easier for somebody to come compete with you. For example, Google, not only did they build a superior engine for generating highly accurate search results. I remember the first time I used Google, I was an undergrad here at Stanford or maybe a grad student. And uh, it was just stunning because we all used AltaVista or Yahoo and the search results sucked and you had to go through three, four, five, six pages to get to the right search result. First time you saw Google, you typed it in, it was one of the first three results, the right answer. And then the next time, it was one of the first three results. So they fundamentally reinvented how effective um, how effective their search engine was. But imagine if they had just done that and done what Yahoo did, stick a bunch of banner ads on top of the search results. That would have been a whole lot def less defensible because as the cost of providing those search results goes down and the cost of crawling and storing the internet and calculating the backlinks go down, somebody could easily replicate that model. What they built was they built the business model to support that superior search technology which required a significant amount of engineering and the network effects of advertisers bidding on keywords and having high performance click-throughs rise to the top. So um, I think that's, is that all the content that I have? Yes, so that's all the, all the uh, slide content that I had. I thought we'd save 15 minutes for questions at the end. That's my email address, uh, my Twitter handle. Um, we have some information about the iFund on our website. Uh, feel free to contact me with any of those, but we can open it up for questions. Okay, the question is, you have a couple ideas and for iPhone applications, and you've gotten feedback that they're more lifestyle applications than large, say, application categories. And how would an investor think about that, and how should you as an entrepreneur think about that? Um, the first thing I'd say is, you should solve a problem that you're passionate about solving. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. If you're not interested in it, it doesn't matter how big it is. You're just not going to have a lot of fun doing it, and you're not going to do it that excellently either. Uh, you know, Facebook, I met the company when it was six employees. They were building a, a phone book for college campuses. That's all it was. But Zuck was really, really focused on doing that very well. Because he did it excellently, many other opportunities were open to him. He was able to build platforms. He was able to go beyond college campuses. Now he's able to use the social graph that they have at Facebook to do personalization across the internet and make the whole web more social. Uh, but if he hadn't been passionate about solving that single initial problem, it would have been pretty hard to do all the things beyond there because you wouldn't have done it excellently. Um, that having been said, if you're deciding between multiple application ideas, I'd pick one that even though it might be small initially, it seems to have more opportunity ahead of it as opposed to a very discreetly constrained uh, uh, application. For example, a, a way to identify uh, dog walkers in Palo Alto. Okay? And if you constrain it very narrowly, and that's what you want to work on, that's unlikely to have a lot of extensibility, because it requires a lot of penetration of that particular application is for a particular Use case has got to be synchronicity of time, things like that, right? Um, but generally, a marketplace for, uh, for pet care and services, local services, starting with dog walking, well, that's going to have a whole lot more opportunity ahead of it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. But I think, you know, before it used to be starting web businesses, like 10 years ago, you needed to raise a bunch of venture capital, and you therefore had to go for the big home run. Nowadays, it's much more possible to start what I'd call like coffee shop businesses on the web or in mobile, where it's the, it's the virtual equivalent of physically starting a coffee shop and having a few friends invest and generating cash flow from that for a lifestyle business. There's nothing wrong with that at all. People who start coffee shops are entrepreneurs just as much as the people who started Google. Yeah, so what's the question is, what's the initial investment amount required for the iFund or just generally? 
for the iPhone, we'll invest as little as two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars in a company. It's it's hard to it's hard for too much less than that to do anything other than just build a product. You for less than that you could build a product, but you can't really hire an engineering team. You can't really market the product. You can't really do partnerships. You can't really start to build a company. Uh, so the the minimum that we generally invest we we have invested less. But what we think of as a minimum is about two hundred fifty thousand dollars to help get a company get started. We'll invest up to you know forty million dollars over the life of a company. And then the, the sorry, I don't mean to interrupt us, but the, the lower bound of like the threshold of the market or revenue run rate. Uh, what's the lower bound on the revenue run rate? There is none. Um, the vast majority of the companies that we funded that I showed on the slide, uh, they had no revenue. They just had a business plan when when we met them and funded them. Back there. So let's say I have, an, I have an app, I've submitted it to the app store, and it's, it's growing. At what stage would I approach a venture capital company for more investment? How do I know when and how to go about it? OK, so the question is, let's say that you've got an app, you've submitted it to app store, customers are using it, and it's growing. When do you approach a venture capital firm or, or an investor of any type? Um, this is going to sound like a cop-out answer. But it is the right answer. You should approach an investor when you've decided you want to build a company. It's, it has very little to do with the metrics, right? Some, like I mentioned, most of the companies that we funded, Booya, Shopkick, Cool Iris, Goji, none of them even had a product at the time that we started. They had a business plan. So they had zero users, and they hadn't even gotten to the point when they had submitted an application to the App Store and had it growing, like you specified. Um, but they had concluded that they wanted to build a company. And so they came to seek investment and assistance in the process of building that company. Uh, it's not just capital that investors should be providing you, because your grandma can give you capital. Uh, it should be capital, advice, relationships, the ability to help you accelerate the company building process. Um, so it's very much a personal decision on when you're ready to look for funding. But uh, you know, to put it in, in stark terms, if you have a iPhone, iPad, I, you know, iPod Touch, iOS application that's getting hundreds of thousands of downloads and ten, certainly tens of thousands of daily active users, and it's in a category that looks like it, there could be something more there, you should definitely talk to investors. So the question is, is it still beneficial to approach VCs early on? Uh, yes, in the process of building a relationship, even though you may not be ready or need to take uh, funding at that time. What does the funding process look like? OK. So the funding process in every firm is different. I'll tell you about our firm. Um, in our firm, you're going to get introduced, most likely, to a specific partner. And the reason that it's important to get introduced to that partner is because we get tens of thousands of random emails that come in every year into our partnership. And we can't read them all, and we can't process through all of them. On the other hand, if Paul or David or in one example, I was just sharing them, Steve Jobs called us and he said, you have to invest in this company. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And, you know, wait, not ever. He never says that. But it's the coolest thing I've seen in this category. You know, we ended up investing in that company you know, 35, 40 days later. Um, there, there is a, a, a range of signal relative to the noise. And some signals are higher and some signals are lower. Your goal is to get introduced by somebody that has pretty strong signal within a firm or within an investment group because it means that you're going to get immediate attention and someone's going to take the time to really learn about your company. Okay, So you come in, you have a first meeting with us, and we talk about the opportunity. We get to know you. We understand your business plan. We understand what product you're going to build. Uh, the next step would be if that partner is very interested in this opportunity, he'll pull together two or three other partners, and we'll sit down with you again, and we'll surface a group of questions that are the key questions we need to answer, or we think you as an entrepreneur need to answer along with us to determine whether or not there is a company building opportunity here. 
we'd go through with you collaboratively and do due diligence. Some of it might be technical due diligence. Some of it might be partner due diligence. Let's say you need content partners to participate with you in this application. We'd want to call some of them and explore these opportunities. That is a process also by which we can help you do business development because we have relationships with a lot of these partners and say, hey, you know, if we were to fund this company, would you want to work together with them? What would that look like? And start to socialize those ideas. Um, certainly references on you as an entrepreneur as well. People who you've worked with in the past, people who you've worked for in the past, investors that have backed you in the past if you have had a previous venture. And then finally it concludes with a partner meeting uh, in which all of KP's partners are invited to come meet you, hear about your business, and then we make an investment decision after that. So usually the process is, you know, it could be as, as few as, I'm doing a seed investment right now that I met the entrepreneur on uh, Wednesday and we'll make a decision actually my partners are meeting them right now but Paul I did not cancel this um, uh, we'll make a decision by five o'clock this afternoon so it could be as fast as you know three days realistically it's a few weeks that's a seed investment so it's not going to have a whole lot of diligence it's an idea for a seed investment no because a seed investment, usually we're investing alongside a bunch of angels or other firms, all of whom are contributing a little bit of capital. And we're there to help, but we won't take a board seat. And Kleiner's got a, a very broad platform. We have two full-time, we, we have 21 investing partners, uh, to put it in perspective, in three groups. We have a life sciences group that does therapeutics and devices and personalized medicine. We have a green tech group that does everything from wind turbines to biofuels to smart grid to cars. We're building two new car companies. And we've got a digital group that does mobile applications and internet and cloud computing software. So we've got 21 investing partners. We've got two full-time recruiting partners. We have a former Nobel, Pre or a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Al Gore, within our partnership. He's very involved. We've got board members at Apple, Google, Amazon, and HP. Uh, the chairman of the board of HP is one of our partners. So that full apparatus is really available to you once we're, we've funded your company in a Series A or Series B and we've taken a board seat. We said, hey, we're going to go build a company together. As a seed investment, you're collecting a bunch of capital and you say, I'm going to go experiment with this and I'll come back to you in six months and I'll show you whether or not what I, the hypotheses that I've laid out about what will work has actually worked. At that point, I'm ready to build a company. So there are no, it's a long-winded way of saying there's no uh, equity requirements for something that's in the seed category. Other questions? Go ahead. Um, once, kind of to back off that question, um, once you've decided to invest in a company, um, how much kind of control and influence do you have over the decisions in that company? The rest of the time? Are you deciding what future apps they design? And, like, Most definitely not. So, oh, the question, sorry, was how much control does a venture investor have over a company and do they decide what apps the company is going to decide? Uh, no, the entrepreneur is the entrepreneur and runs the company. Uh, we're there to provide advice and support. What we can do, though, is having invested in 15 companies in this category, we can give you feedback on what hasn't worked, mistakes that other people have made. So let's say you decide to do something uh, that we know for sure will be rejected by Apple's approval process. We'll just tell you, hey, let's not put that in the product. Uh, build, build the product differently. Let's go have a conversation with them and talk about you know, the reasons why this might not violate their SDK or their payment requirements or their privacy and security. But don't put that in the product on this rev. But no, we don't design and build products. That's not what we do. Go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, how has your investment thesis changed in the past couple of years, and how do you see it changing going in the future? So, yeah, our investment thesis, I think this, uh, this slide here illustrates it the best. Our investment thesis for the importance of this category has only grown. Um, when we initially started this in March of 08, it really wasn't clear how successful the iOS platform was going to be and mobile, mobile uh, platforms in general. And it definitely wasn't clear whether or not this whole App Store thing was going to work out. Right? They announced the SDK. A lot of people are like, who would ever build mobile applications? This is just not going to happen. Well, clearly, the device adoption is great and the App Store adoption is great. So I think what is 
clear to us is the magnitude of the opportunity is much larger than we'd ever thought. NGMoCo is a good example. So NGMoCo we funded in the summer of 2008, three months after we announced the iFund. Just over two years later, the company was acquired for $400 million. It's really rare to have companies that are only around for two years and 100 or so employees that are acquired for that amount of money in that short period of time. Um, you know, some might say that the entrepreneur decided to sell too early because the bulk of the market opportunity is ahead of them. That's a, a separate debate. But certainly, the scale of the opportunity and the rate of uptake is larger than we thought. Um, there are still a lot of problems, though, to be solved because the ubiquity and always-on nature of mobile, which is theoretically possible, is not yet practically possible. Really, what you want this to be is you want this to be a probe that discovers things and has intelligence for you as you're walking around the world and in a, uh, in a user passive way brings information and activity and commerce back to you. A lot of those technical problems haven't been solved yet, so those are things that we're looking for going forward. Get a question. To speak up, please. Is uh, iFund a seed investment or is it a VC investment? The question is, is the iFund a seed investment vehicle or a VC investment vehicle? Uh, it's both. We've invested as little as 250000 We've invested as much as uh, 15 million, or actually 18 million in some companies. So we have, we have a wide charter to invest whatever we want. That's a good question. So the question is, are the days over when small teams can be successful in the App Store, and is it really about big companies or people with big company experience now? Uh, I would answer clearly, no, those days are definitely not over. I continue to be amazed every day. Just open up your iPhone or your iPad every day and look at the applications in the top 25. You'll, you'll find, you'll be, you'll be amazed at how many of the, those applications are being built by companies you've never even heard of. And you go and you Google this company name, and it's like three kids in a garage in Vancouver. And we're living this right now because we, you know, we got a company in the free texting space. There is another company that's competing with them, which is literally two engineering students that graduated from a university around Vancouver. And, you know, our company has had. I think 15 million of funding go into it. They've got 40 employees down, to L down in LA. Uh, three of their founders are experienced entrepreneurs, but these guys are just copying every feature and matching feature for feature. Now, it's gonna be hard for them to build a company uh, around that, but it's certainly possible for them to compete in the App Store. You don't need a lot of resources to compete on a product basis. You will need a lot of resources to compete on a, uh, on a company building basis. Sales and marketing, business development, uh, product marketing, things like that. Uh, how important is it to have like, some of those non-technical skills or non-technical founders? So in terms of the founding team, how important is it to have non-technical founders? Um, at the very early stages, it's not that important. Several strong technical people can constitute the core of your founding team. Now, when you get to the next stage of your business and you need partnerships and you need sales and you need uh, executive leadership to build out a management team, that's when you want to start adding um, non-technical non employees or early employees to help you with that. Uh, but I would focus above all on having superior technical and product talent. I consider product a core part of technology and engineering because I think the two cannot be separated. And in most companies, the great engineers are, in many cases, driving the product. So uh, iPhone 3 is a lot slower than iPhone 4. So my program only runs on iPhone 4. Um, how much in stock is in iPhone 4 versus the older version? Oh, okay. Uh, the question is the, the installed base of iPhone 4 versus iPhone 3. I, I really don't know. Uh, there are published reports about this. You can go and you can look at AdMob puts out a report once a quarter. Uh, and there are other companies that do sampling of mobile websites that tell you what the OS distribution is. Well, actually, I guess the OS distribution won't be perfect because iOS 4 runs on the 3GS. But it will give you some insight into that. Um, and I'd recommend reading the blogs to find that out. Um, this is related to the previous question, but uh, what have you 
we've seen is are some of the most effective ways that companies get momentum in the beginning, given that like now it's getting more saturated to go directly to that. Sorry. Okay, so the most effective methods of building momentum. Um, are you guys familiar with a company called Smule? So Smule did something really cool. With every product they launched, they built a viral YouTube video that got transmitted all over the, the internet and Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, that then pointed people back to purchasing or downloading the application. Um, I think that the best marketing uh, approaches to the App Store these days outside of building a great relationship with the Apple App Store team so that you get featured. That's number one, right? But I assume you knew that. Um, a lot of the best marketing opportunities now come from very authentic, grassroots social media approaches because if you get the right people to tweet about or Facebook share your product or Facebook like your product, lots of people are going to hear about it. So uh, Flipboard had a really fantastic launch. You guys probably all certainly read about it. I don't know if you have iPads. They had a really amazing launch driven primarily by two things, Robert Scoble and Ashton Kutcher. Scoble and Ashton Kutcher both tweeted about it and did videos about it, and it just got, got retweeted and reblogged everywhere all over the internet, and they, had, they weren't even featured inside of the App Store. They had a phenomenal launch and a lot of great usage. Uh, NG Moco, this was in the much earlier days of the platform, but NG Moco had a really amazing launch because Kevin Rose tweeted about uh, Topple, their first game, and shot to the top of the charts. And then because they had a good cross-sell strategy with Maze Finger and some of the other applications, mm -hmm. were able to pull the others up too. Scoble is a total, uh, you know, I, I won't use yeah. so Scoble loves any new technology product, saying he's very successful. Ashton Kutcher a little bit less, so you know, there's, you, you have to kind of work with his people. Um, you know, getting local media to write about it. The TechCrunch guys will write about anything, and they love covering new, uh, new products and sort of uh, exploring with the entrepreneur what that market opportunity might be. I definitely focus on the PR and media angle. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're out of time, huh? All right. Thanks for having me today. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.